me look like, have we started recording? This will, yes, it is recording. Yeah. I'm just going to go off video so I can make sure that Jay gets on all right. Sounds good. Oh, I do see Jay in the list. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, we, are, we will get started momentarily. We're just giving everybody a chance to uh, log in. So bear with us and we'll begin shortly. All right, it's a few minutes after, and I, I know we have a, a packed agenda today, so we're going to get the meeting started. Um, my name is Olivia Velez. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Global Digital Health Network. Um, today's monthly meeting is being organized by IntraHealth on can digitally enabled family planning, reproductive, maternal, newborn, adolescent, and child health approaches improve health outcomes. And I'm going to pass it over to Amy Finnegan to take you through today's session. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining or say hi, everyone, instead of good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at. Um, thanks for joining today. I was asked um, on behalf of IntraHealth to organize this webinar today. And I thought I have the perfect set of people for you. Um, a lot of my colleagues at Duke are doing really interesting digitally enabled work in family planning and reproductive health. And I thought we could bring them together to talk about how they develop their tools, how and why they develop their tools, how they're being used, kind of what are the challenges in developing them? What have we learned from doing this kind of work? And so I've brought together today um, Megan Hutchko, who's the director of the Center for Global Reproductive Health at Duke. She's going to talk about MSADA, which is um, an app for cervical cancer um, screening and um, getting the results. Uh, Nick Pearson is the CEO of Jacaranda Health, and along with Jay Patel, the tech and analytics manager, they're going to be talking about um, prompts and what Jacaranda is doing in, um, in Kenya. And then Diana Klatt is a senior project manager for insights at NIVI, and she's going to talk about um, NIVI, which is a self-help app for um, family planning. And me, I'm Amy Finnegan. I'm a senior data scientist at Interhealth, Interhealth International. So we're going to give these um, panelists a chance to talk about their work. And then I have a few questions that I'll moderate among the panelists. And then we'll open up to the audience. And I wanted to let you know that we're in webinar mode. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A button. At any time, feel free to put in a question into the q and I'll be moderating those as we go along. So if you have a clarification question or something you want to um, bring up during the end session, please do that um, there. And then we can also probably unmute you to ask questions at the end, but we can also, I can read those questions out to the panelists at the end. Um, great, thanks everyone for joining. I think with that, we will just get started. So I will send it over to Megan. Great, thanks Amy. Let me share my screen, if I have that. Um, Everyone see my slides? Great, okay. So um, as Amy said, I'm the director um, for the Center for Global Reproductive Health at Duke. I'm an OBGYN and I've been working in Western Kenya for about the last 15 or 16 years. Um, and so I'm gonna present um, MSADA, uh, which is a, pro a digital app that we developed to address some of the gaps in cervical cancer prevention. Um, that we found um, through our work um, in Kisumu and Magori County. So my the target of my research is cervical cancer prevention. Um, I always start with a slide that presents the health disparity. Um, there are about almost 600,000 new cases and over 300,000 deaths annually. Um, this very much aligns with the Human Development Index with a much greater burden being in low and middle income countries. In fact, 90% of the world's cases and deaths come from these countries. As you can see in these maps here, the biggest burden of disease is in um, South, uh, is in Sub-Saharan Africa and then some countries in Latin America. Um, and you can see this is even more compounded when you look at this map of global mortality, um, where not only are there more cases, there's less access to um, treatment um, for women who are diagnosed. Um, this disparity really drove the World Health Organization to propose um, a, uh, to um, call for cervical cancer elimination as a public health problem in 2018. So um, Dr. Tedros uh, envisions a world without cervical cancer in the next century um, and set over the past year and a half, um, these were actually announced in November of 2020, um, the WHO, WHO, along with multilateral stakeholders, set specific targets to meet to see a 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer by 2030. And these targets include getting 90% of the girls um, fully vaccinated, 70% of women effectively screened either once or twice in their lifetimes, and 90% of women with invasive cancer treated or able to receive palliative therapy. So these are pretty lofty goals and many of the low income countries where we see the disparities in outcomes don't have the health infrastructure resources or technology to meet these goals. Um, so I wanna talk about ways in which digital health can meet the elimination targets. 
Um, so I, um, you know, there are several areas which are currently being studied um, through the NCI, through Unitaid, through um, multiple large grants in which different M health or digital health strategies are being applied. One of the, um, the areas of focus um, is the use of telehealth um, to improve triage or diagnosis of cervical cancer, so taking images and sending them to experts in other um, in urban centers or in other countries or regions. Um, and there's a big focus on automated algorithms, um, so not just taking images, but using deep learning to understand those images and make an automatic diagnosis to provide a potentially point of care um, solution that could lead to either referral or treatment on the spot. Um, there is work, um, and this isn't the sort of interesting, um, sexy work that people are hearing about, but there's a lot of work at the clinic, country, and regional level to develop data systems to, to facilitate tracking and real-time program evaluation. And I think this is probably in IntraHealth's wheelhouse because they really work on um, improve, using data science uh, to improve health outcomes across the systems, from what uh, Amy has said. Um, but I'm going to talk today about clinical tools. So I think there is um, a lot of interest and applicability in using mHealth or digital health clinical tools to help with decision support, patient tracking, and patient messaging for um, education and follow-up. And so the clinical tool that we built is um, came out of our work in Migori um, in Kenya, and I know many of you guys work in Kenya. Migori is on the um, western edge of Kenya. Um, Kenya is in East Africa. It has a high burden of both HIV and cervical cancer. It's a PEPFAR country. Um, they recently introduced the vaccine uh, right before uh, the pandemic hit. So some of their HPV vaccine um, initiatives have been scaled back, but they are a GAVI supported vaccine country. Um, they have recently started to, to uh, amp up HPV based testing for cervical cancer screening. Um, but there's really a disparity in um, both in between urban and rural centers. So in Macquarie, um, it's an area of the country where 85% of the population has less than a secondary school education. It's an agricultural economy and there's a very limited healthcare infrastructure. It's one of the highest HIV prevalence areas in the country, but um, the um, World Health, uh, or, um, uh, I'm sorry, there was a group from UCSF that was sponsored by the World Bank that developed a model of community health campaign based HPV testing and linkage that met the, eight, the 90 90 90 targets and was one of the first models of care that was able to show that. Um, as Amy said, now these are 95 95 95, but um, by offering health in the community, they were able to reach these lofty targets. So we took that model and adapted it to cervical cancer screening. We felt like there are a lot of similarities between the screening um, where women just need to get tested once. If they're negative, they can be out of the system for five or 10 years before they have to come into a clinic. They can be educated by community health um, volunteers, uh, which is the cadre in, in Kenya. So you can see here, we worked with women's groups, community health volunteers to really talk to women about what is cervical cancer? What does screening mean? What do I do if I have a positive HPV? And then we went out to communities in these health campaigns. Um, we chose either market days or non-market days. We worked with the community to figure out where and when to run these um, campaigns. They were able to screen, if you can see in this picture, we had tents made that had canvas flaps with a private area. So women were able to screen themselves with HPV. Um, and then we ran the lab tests and the um, results were provided either by cell phone or phone call. Um, and we did everything in partnership with the Ministry of Health out there. And so what we found was that HPV testing was highly acceptable, especially when it was offered in these community health campaigns, which we actually compared to clinic-based testing. However, we were really only able to reach about 50 to 60% of the population. And there was a high attrition between screening and treatment. So if we're screening all these women get, and getting a positive result but not doing anything with it, there's not going to be any real health impact of our program. We found that over two thirds of the women chose cell phone based results, either text or phone call. Um, the others were given the option of home visits. Um, but we thought uh, we found differences between the groups who had cell phone access and chose to use it um, and those that needed, wanted a home visit. 
women with more connection to the healthcare system, prior involvement reflected in either HIV testing, um, family planning use, um, or and higher education levels were more likely to opt for a cell phone based system. However, the women who received an in person home visit were more lo likely to follow up for treatment. So we felt like the the communication they were getting from the um, text based or phone call results wasn't enough. And then we also found um, that there were persistent misconceptions in the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer um, and that seemed to have implications on both screening decision making and follow up for treatment. And then women admitted that their confidence in the CHV or the community health volunteer led messaging varied. So we took these results. So we had a lot of enthusiasm for the community health campaign based testing, and we wanted to see whether M health could work to address some of these gaps. So we know that Kenya is a high mobile phone um, uh, use, uh, ownership and usage area. Um, and we saw in our own study that, you know, in this much poorer area of the country, we even got two thirds of women um, to be able to, uh, who opted and were able to use phones. So we sought to see whether a clinical tool to support CHV protocol use, counseling and patient tracking could ultimately improve the impact of cervical cancer prevention strategies. So um, we are lucky, I'm lucky, I guess, because I, I work at Duke um, and have a lot of talent there. Um, so we sought the help of students in a senior level class who for their thesis met with us to understand our needs and develop a mobile um, application. So we told them we wanted an app that would help with CHV counseling um, and then provide patient and specimen tracking. Um, and we wanted, if possible, um, educational messaging and service reminders that could go out to the patient. Um, tracking tools for CHV, so reporting and reminders that would go to a CHV phone, and then report generation for the county health management team. Um, so they took two semesters and they developed MSADA. And then we had a graduate student um, go into Kenya. So this is already based on pretty extensive preliminary work for the needs, but we really wanted to be in the field um, for the final stages of MSADA development. So we um, uh, had an amazing master student who uh, designed and carried out an iterative development study with the goal to have different waves of feedback. One of the students in the, in the um, senior thesis program is uh, from Kenya. So we moved to Kenya and he was going to do the programming between feedback waves. Um, and then we were going to pro uh, provide the improved app and then um, continue this feedback cycle until we had a higher level of high level of satisfaction, at which time it was going to be piloted. So we carried out the iterative development study in Migori and in Kisumu. And what it consisted of was six um, feedback sessions over five um, weeks. So we had um, three sessions in week one uh, with four participants each. And then in weeks two for four, we worked with the developer to do the feedback integration. And then three sessions again in um, week five. Um, we use, or Jacob, I should say, um, use the um, prior uh, um, work in this area to devise three participant groups. We wanted to have experts, so experts in the content area who uh, may not necessarily be the ones using it, but would know about cervical cancer prevention, and then community health volunteers, so the ideal end users, and then lay users, so people who may not be community health volunteers, and we got those from our research staff and colleagues. And so after each of these feedback sessions, we did in-depth interviews, and then we had a usability survey. Um, so at these sessions, we had screen by screen walkthroughs in a group setting, and then we had simulation activities. So we pull, pulled in um, research assistants to do client provider role play, client Q&A, a screening demonstration, and then client data retrieval. So could you put information about a patient in and then bring it up at a later date? And what we found is that people really liked the app. They found it to be um, the overall layout to be appropriate and comprehensive. And they felt that um, it was usable and um, had, uh, they felt like there was good user responsiveness. Um, they uh, had, they were very positive about the graphics, but they had some feedback on both the graphic uh, modeling and the imaging. And I think important for us is they felt like, 
Um, some of the images may not be appropriate for all cultural settings. Um, and so those were some of the general positive feedback. Um, we definitely worked on the imaging and then um, areas where we really did change the app um, substantially is that they liked the simple direct language, but they suggested translating the information into local languages. So in Western Kenya, um, although the app was in English, the CHVs often worked in Luo or Swahili, and they felt like it would be hard to translate on the fly. So as you can see, these are some of the images that we used, um, and we offered, we translated all of the counseling into um, uh, Luo and uh, Kiswahili, um, as well as the directions then. And, and this was very much appreciated by the staff, so they would not have to translate. And I think it was an important step in making sure that the right information was getting provided um, correctly. Um, we uh, worked with, uh, so the, the participants raised feasibility concerns, including the charging, the need for internet connection, and the importance of reliable technical support. So we were able to use those findings to go back to the county health management teams um, because they're very enthusiastic about the app as HPV um, testing was being rolled out to sort of bring these needs back to them. Um, and then they highlighted uh, the need for reliable and stable solutions for both app programming and backend data storage. So um, in the user language, that meant we were finding that it was, uh, um, we had to improve some of the technology and helping them um, search clients um, who had previously been seen. So over those two waves of um, user feedback and feedback integration, um, we changed the app's appearance. So this was the original appearance that the students came up with um, to just be a little slicker and in, um, have clearer buttons for them to push. Um, so they would enter this um, screening info um, button and everything that would follow would be color coded in purple. So they would know that they were in the screening information um, uh, section. Um, they could eat um, pretty early on branch off into the language of their choice and then the rest of what they would see would be in that language. Um, here's where they would um, previously search for patients. Again, this is all color coded now to be in blue and the search was a lot more clear. Same for questions. We changed the question app quite a bit to be more um, clear. Uh, so this is what Previously, questions was down here. Now, if they clicked on questions, again, um, the language was very important. Um, and here, they were able to click on a theme of a question and then get to the specific questions that they were answering. Um, and then we really um, worked with multiple developers to improve the patient search um, algorithm to make it more uh, user friendly for them to either enter a client or search a client that had previously been um, worked on. So um, that is where the app stands now. We actually did a pilot, but I'm not going to talk about the pilot um, today. I just want to go through the, the um, user feedback. Um, and um, so what we found is that mHealth uh, can play an important part in addressing some of the information ga implementation gaps in cervical cancer screening. Um, we're really excited about this. I think more than um, the ability to work within our setting. We're really excited that the Ministry of Health and the County Health Management team has decided to take this on and integrate it with some of their clinic-based um, patient tracking systems. Um, we found clearly that even with substantial preliminary work, I mean, this was the result of about seven years of working with HPV screening, iterative development um, with substantial contextual knowledge was key. Um, and then, you know, there are challenges that remain, including fitting into the existing technology and infrastructure, um, having a responsive developer team on the ground, um, and of course, navigating the regulatory environment. And I would say that's where, that's ch more challenging at Duke than in Kenya. Um, right now. Um, and then we really need to, um, to test the effectiveness within the resource availability and constraints of the public health setting. So how will it work programmatically to support this when there's not you know, NIH funding behind it? So that's all I have to say. We welcome you to learn more about our work. Um, uh, you can check out our website or our Twitter handle. And then I just want to acknowledge the people that helped with this study and some of the funders. Great, Megan. Thanks so much. Um, uh, while Nick is getting his slides up here, I'll just say a few comments. Um, I think that your project is unique in being able to draw on students, right? And as someone who's been at Duke or 
still at Duke for a long time, you know, having this kind of resource of students who are funded to help you with your research and app development, I think is really a unique thing that we have at Duke. All right, Nick, go ahead. Um, I think, Megan, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you were a little bit over 15 minutes. So I am going to be watching the clock on yours, Nick, and I might butt in if you get to 15 minutes. Thanks, Dave. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those of you uh, overseas in, in, uh, in other countries. Um, but it's great to great to see everyone. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed being a participant in the Global Digital Health Network over the years. Uh, this is a great forum. So um, my name is Nick Pearson. I'm the Executive Director of Jacaranda Health and an Adjunct Associate Faculty Member at Duke, uh, the Duke Global Health Institute. And um, Jacaranda Health is an organization that, let me see if I can advance my slides. We're an organization and our, our vision is really a world where all moms and babies, sort of regardless of income level, are able to access childbirth safely and respectfully. Um, and you, we have our roots actually as a service delivery organization. We run um, as a sister organization, one of uh, Nairobi's highest quality maternity hospitals that provides affordable, respectful care to moms uh, in the lower income parts of the city. Um, and that organization has now sort of become a separate standalone entity and is, is expanding to new maternity hospitals. And we, we took um, some of what we've learned in that to sort of expand the focus of our core nonprofit which is primarily based in Nairobi, to, um, to have a sort of a broader impact on maternal health in the region. And our focus really now is on partnering with governments, county governments and national governments around um, improving outcomes in maternal and, and infant health uh, in the public health systems where 80% of the moms are delivering their babies. Um, and the way that we do that is by sort of taking some of the innovations that we've developed over the years, sort of integrating them very closely with our government partners in public facilities, um, and then scaling those and measuring the impact along the way and continuing to iterate with feedback from moms and also from frontline nurses and our, our government partners. Um, and our goal is eventually to be to have these innovations sort of adopted as a measure of as part of national standard of care and be sustainable at, at scale over the long run. Um, and so our our we have two core programs and they address two of the biggest challenges for maternal health in the in the region. And um, there's a some interesting work that was done several years back that that unpacked sort of maternal mortality in um, in Kenya and it sort of broke it down into two of the biggest drivers were one um related to sort of nurse quality of care in the interpartum period so basically like gaps in quality and knowledge uh, among frontline providers and uh 33 of the deaths were caused by sort of patient demand side delays in accessing care um, and our two primary programs address those two critical uh, gaps. And I'm going to focus on one of them here, which is our sort of digital health program, obviously much more relevant to this uh, to this group. Um, but I'll say a word about the former, which is a sort of a nurse mentorship program, which is um, which is uh, focused on improving sort of um, long term improvement of emergency obstetric skills among frontline providers and creating a kind of a sustainable way of developing champions within public hospitals where a lot of the babies are delivered. Um, today we'll focus on prompts, which is our digital health platform that's really focused on trying to both empower moms and connect them to care sort of at the moments when they really need it uh, during their pregnancy. Um, Right now, we've been scaling quickly over the course of the last couple of years. We're, you know, in working with over 300,000 moms to date in um, several hundred facilities. And our goal over the next two years is to expand to sort of a, um, to encompass and be working with over 60% of the moms who are delivering uh, in Kenya in a given year. Um, and we're also looking at global expansion too. And so, if anyone is interested in chatting with us about that, we'd love to sort of trade notes on it as we uh, look at new countries. Um, I won't say anything about the mentorship program now, but this is just sort of a flash of some of the outcomes that we see where we were sort of measuring um, both improvements in knowledge and practice uh, in during intrapartum care and also measuring improvements in outcomes, both reductions in things like morbidity, like postpartum hemorrhage and, um, and measuring in DHIS uh, reductions in, in neonatal deaths, which is really exciting and has been um, of a lot of interest to our government partners. <clears throat> So the prompts program is sort of what we're what we're talking about today, and this is um, 
this is a sort of a snapshot of some of the key components of it. It's basic, fundamentally, it's a sort of an SMS program that reaches out to moms. Uh, we use an SMS platform, I'm always happy to answer why not um, other data and digital uh, media like, um, like WhatsApp and Telegram. We reach the most people via SMS. That's the sort of where we see most of the demand and the best way to reach sort of farthest, um, sort of farthest reaches of the country. Um, and um, it began basically as a sort of a push SMS program, but very quickly evolved into a sort of a two-way communication where we have a help desk that's set up to manage questions and um, triage care as questions come in that flag concerns. And over the as we as that got bigger and bigger, we <clears throat> ended up having to build in some really interesting um, infrastructure around uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing using using machine learned learning to. Um, to improve the way that we could sort of triage those requests and connect them better and faster into the health system uh, at scale and efficiently. Um, my colleague Jay, our technology and analytics manager, will talk about that in just a second. But just to give you a, a really quick snapshot of sort of what this looks like from the patient perspective, this is basically like a mom who's going into a public um, a public facility for her prenatal visit. She sees a short code. This is, you know, it's it's white labeled. It's branded as if it's from the county government. Um, so she sees a short code. She's able to enroll during her prenatal care uh, in the prompts program, and she starts re uh, receiving messages during the course of the course of the pregnancy. And there's about a hundred messages over the course of pregnancy in the first year postpartum. But during that period, those messages are a sort of an, a mix of some educational and sort of coaching messages, but also some sort of key um, nudges, behavioral nudges and queries to try and get um, get feedback and elicit questions around uh, potential danger signs during pregnancy. And so if she um, texts back with any kind of question, the question can be benign or it could be clinically concerning, our help desk agents are able to both um, respond to that and if it's urgent, connect her to care and with the hospitals where we're also working with the frontline providers. Um, Jay's gonna dive into, oh, and just a quick snapshot of sort of where we are so far with this is sort of working across over 400 facilities in Kenya. We have 350,000 women enrolled in the program and we're growing very quickly. We have um, partnerships now with the ministry to sort of look at this at a national level. Um, my colleague Jay's gonna say a few words about um, the, um, the uh, the way that the sort of big data and artificial intelligence sort of underpins and helps um, helps move this forward faster. Um, but first, this last slide is about um, some of the impact that we've seen. And this is from early. We're about to run a much more robust um, implementation research trial over the course of the next two years with some partners at Harvard. But um, some of the early RCT data that we've been able to see in terms of improvements of um, outcomes has been sort of both behavioral uptake in terms of things like prenatal visits, also significant increase in the uptake of postpartum family planning of women enrolled in the platform. So exciting, um, exciting, um, exciting outcomes. Jay, do you want to um, present some of the, the data pieces? Thanks, Nick. Um, so as Nick mentioned, we're growing quite rapidly. Right now, we're getting uh, 1,500 questions every day, but this is increasing month to month. Um, most of the questions we get are general in nature, uh, and one of the most, most common ones is whether it's okay to eat avocados during pregnancy. There's also questions about insurance and a bunch of other topics. But about 30% of the questions are potentially medically serious, and things like bleeding or swelling or headaches um, one challenge we were facing uh, was that it really didn't make sense to answer the questions in the order they came in. And we needed to prioritize uh, the urgent questions and somehow like float the danger sign questions to the top for the help desk to get to first. Um, the other challenge was how to handle the growing, growing volumes without also proportionally increasing the size of the help desk staff, which in the long term is not really sustainable. Um, next slide, please. And that's where the AI comes in. Uh, we've developed uh, an AI. It basically sits in between the mother um, asking the question and the help desk receiving the question. So what the AI does, it basically reads each incoming question and then decides what is this mother asking about. Uh, based on that decision, it then assigns a category or what we call an intent to each question, along with a priority level and a suggested response. All of this goes to the help desk who can then filter for the urgent questions and reply to them first before we move on to the avocado questions, for example. Next slide, please. So here's one example. Um, 
uh, mom's asking whether it's okay to eat av avocados during pregnancy. The bot or the triage bot, as we call it, will flag that as a nutrition question, assign it a lower priority, and then attach uh, the suggested response. Um, and uh, next slide for another example um, where a mom is experiencing bleeding. So in that case, we set it to an urgent priority. The intent would be set as bleeding. Um, and then the suggested response also is there. It's clinically vetted so that our agents can copy paste it into their answer um, before sending, uh, sending edited, editing for context and sending the response out. So one thing to note is that we're not machine learning experts. Uh, we don't have the resources to hire someone whose sole job is to, to focus on creating a machine learning model. Um, and the solution that we deployed had to, of course it had to work, but it also had to be built in such a way that a small team could maintain, uh, build and maintain it. And it had to also be cost-effective to use. So the model is about 90% accurate for general intents and about 95% accurate for danger sign related intents. Uh, we're always refining and improving it. But once we deployed it, um, we, the next step was to see how we could automate some of the responses. And the reasoning was twofold. First, get the information to moms immediately, even before the help desk gets around to it, uh, even, especially after working hours when the help desk was not available. And uh, to provide the first level of safety check, what we did is that once a particular intent was detected, we'd send the mom a menu the mom would then uh, pick from the menu to uh, to basically pick the um, symptoms she was experiencing after which we'd send her more information about that. The results on this, to be quite frank, were not great. <laughs> Only 5% of moms who, who received this menu actually interacted with it. Uh, they'd actually mostly ignore it or simply re-ask their question. And that created more work for the help desk rather than less. Um, and in retrospect, it was kind of obvious why it failed because everyone hates interacting with venues and I hate interacting with venues. <laughs> um, and so we iterated to version two and we tried something else where instead of sending the menu, the bot or triage bot detects uh, the particular intent and we send only the information that's related to that intent. Um, and we don't ask uh, necessarily for the mom to pick. So if a mom's asking about headaches, we send her only headache information. Um, the important thing is that the help desk checks all, autom all the responses uh, automated. And after we send the information out to the mom, we ask her whether it answered her question. Um, it, uh, whether she answers yes or no, the help desk just reconfirms. And then if necessary, actually picks up the phone and, and calls her. So we went from having a 5% response rate uh, with the menu option to about a 43% response rate with this uh, option. Um, and moms are responding that about a third that, that the answer, uh, information provided to answer their question. So a quick uh, word on next steps uh, is we're trying to figure out how the intents are correlated and how we can use the data that we have to intervene even earlier in, in the case of a poten potential issue, um, get the mom to care even faster and hopefully help prevent complications that come from delays in seeking care. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is one example um, based on, you know, here are two moms with uh, two different um, question histories. Uh, if we take the intents for the last four or five questions, uh, can we proactively determine who is potentially in, 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 in uh, experiencing a danger sign uh, can we call them even before they may be uh, may realize it themselves and get them to care even faster? Um, and uh, this is something we're just starting work on. Nick, Amy, do we have uh, two minutes to wrap up, or are we at time? Yeah, you have some time to wrap up. Great. You're at thirteen um, minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, Jay, thank you. And, um, you know, what's exciting about this, obviously, you know, as you can tell, we're sort of a wonky team and we tend to be sort of continually trying to improve the accuracy and efficacy of this intervention. But we're also, 
um, an organization that has really deep ties with the sort of both based in Kenya and with our government partners. And so what we're trying to do is use the data that we're generating uh, through these systems to help improve management of health systems. And I think this is why we've seen a lot of receptivity from our county partners. We're now working with 11 counties across Kenya. We've just got an endorsement from the National Ministry of Health and the Council of Government for some of these programs. Um, and it's because they see us as sort of partners in this process. And one of the things that we do with the data, aside from sort of continuing to provide better service to the moms themselves and connect them to care is use some of what comes out of this to feed into um, the uh, county management system. So for example, a couple of snapshots here are, um, we're able to elicit information about patients' experience in facilities, you know, how they were treated during a facility, what kind of care they experienced when they delivered, and then use that information and feed it back to county partners. And this is the first time a lot of them have gotten essentially like patient feedback surveys, and they use it both for positive and kind of reinforcing feedback for their frontline providers and their facility in charges, which has um, been really fascinating to see. We're also like during COVID, for example, we were able to track based on client feedback, facility um, uh, service interruptions. And there was a lot of them during the, particularly during the early phases of COVID where facilities were shutting down. Recently, there's been a nurse strike. So we can kind of map this and geolocate these and provide these kinds of snapshots back to our county partners, which, you know, just helps them sort of inform them in terms of managing their, their, their resources better, sort of better and smarter. Um, uh, similarly, we're able to look at things like um, where moms are experiencing gaps in prenatal care. So, you know, if they're not getting all the steps of antenatal care, either, you know, in those visit, visits or missing visits, we're also able to sort of provide that reinforcing feedback to our partners as well. And, and lastly, like, one of the things that's kind of interesting is this, we didn't talk about the sort of men nurse mentorship program where we're looking at quality of care uh, among the providers themselves, but we're able to marry that data of, you know, how is quality of care in the facility? What kind of um, knowledge and practice are we seeing at the front among the frontline providers with the experiences that the, um, that the, uh, that the patients and clients are having. And so sort of putting those together in a dashboard also just enables us to sort of feed, feed information better into the health system and have a sort of a more real time um, piece of that. The last thing, as we look at sort of scale and sustainability of these programs, we're sort of ruthlessly focused on the sort of unit costs of these because ultimately they have to be things that are sort of costs that are borne by um, by the government and by county partners. And so, you know, our prompts program is only you know, less than a dollar per mom enrolled for the life cycle of the program. That includes all the technology backend, as well as all the sort of SMS costs, the help desk staffing, et cetera. And so that sort of low unit costs enables us to operate at a pretty large scale um, and get buy-in from, from partners and sort of cr uh, cr cross subsidy and, uh, and, uh, and contribution from government partners to help defray the costs at scale. Um, I will stop there. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to any questions. Great, thank you, Nick and Jay. I love how, um, as Diane is getting her slides up, um, I just, I love how you've been around for so long, right? And it's like this mature product that still continues to evolve. Um, so really a lot of deep insights there. Um, all right, Diana, you're up. Hi, I'm Diana Klatt. I am a social epidemiologist and I am the Senior Product Manager of Insights at uh, Nivi. Um, today I'll be talking about how uh, centering users in health tech uh, allows users to better achieve uh, positive health outcomes. Oh, hang on, I'm not clicking on the slide. Great, okay. So first of all, what is self-care? A lot of times when we think of self-care, we think of things that we see, well, maybe not all of us think this, but the general public thinks about things like taking a bubble bath or just relaxing, which are all great things, but that's not really what self-care means, right? Um, so what self-care is, is, you know, it is having the ability as a consumer of health uh, to be able to make educated and informed decisions that positively benefit your health outcomes in the interest of what you are hoping to achieve. So what we do and why, um, what we're doing is important is right now there is a lot of information scarcity in the healthcare markets. Um, there's a lot of lack of trust and a lack of understanding of what is and what is not quality information, um, what types of information you even need. A lot of times when you do things like Googling, you check on YouTube, sometimes your physician even doesn't really give you the full picture of what it is that 
um, might happen or might not be happening to you related to whatever it is that your health interest is in um, our particular um, uh, field. It's, you know, section reproductive health and family planning. Um, so there's just a very uh, poor method of engagement currently between physicians and um, people and consumers of healthcare in general. Um, so what we do is we uh, work to create a way to enable self-care for users and consumers. So we have Ask Nivy, which is a chat bot, um, and it is powered through AI um, and a confidential messaging system. So that way we can talk to different users throughout different places in the world. Um, we use WhatsApp and Messenger currently, um, and we are able to educate different people on all sorts of topics related to family planning, and it is easy to scale and is low cost. Um, from our chatbot, we are able to garner insights um, to understand ways that our users really need healthcare and where they're at. We're able to meet them at different places because of our insights. Um, you know, we are able to see what types of resources they need, whether or not places are able to meet those resources, how we can work with different um, providers, um, NGOs, organizations, so that way we can get the types of resources that are actually needed by consumers in the areas that they are. Um, and we are also able to have our chatbot uses AI and machine learning so that way we're able to, you know, actually see what types of barriers our users are having, whether it be they don't have transportation, they aren't able to get to a clinic that actually, or a pharmacy that actually has a product, or they simply can't figure out how to get to a pharmacy or they're, you know, we're able to get them referrals to e-pharmacies. We're able to get them consultations that are online. We're able to re recommend these things that might be able to help address some of the barriers that they're seeking, that they're um, experiencing. Um, currently we have 2.4 million users across four different countries, India, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria. Uh, we've had 617 questions asked to us that's outside of the content that we already have, that we are constantly working to help develop more questions, uh, more content to address more needs. Um, and we have over 30% users that are active, constantly asking questions, engaging in the conversations that we've built. Um, and we've also been able to work with we're currently working with nine different customers across NGOs, different commercial health sectors, organizations. Um, and this really helps to create a wider net of what it is that we can offer since we are working with so many different organizations, ministries of health to get messaging out there as well as resources, facilities and things like this. So that way customer, consumers can properly, you know, get the things that they want. So people can work on getting the things that they want to so solve their family planning solutions or family planning needs. So we recently did a study, uh, a pilot study with Sergo Ventures and Chai, the Clinton Health, um, Clinton Health Access Initiative. Um, and our target was to talk to uh, people in rural locations, it's specifically in India and in Madhya Pradesh. Um, which, you know, when people think about what types of um, consumers and what types of people you can reach with things like WhatsApp or uh, Messenger and with, you know, telephones and mobile services, it, you don't normally think of rural areas. Um, we wanted to be able to show that this isn't necessarily the case, that you're able to reach a large amount of people even in rural areas. And we, um, our goal was to get people in rural communities, uh, information on FB topics, to find ways to connect to health facilities, um, contraceptive services, pharmacies, and to help strengthen um, the way that the government is working on family planning and abortion services within the state of Madhya Pradesh in India. Um, so during our pilot study, we found that there was actually a quite a high um, method amount of people that were really eager to learn about um, the way that, you know, we take up um, family planning and they, they wanted to get family planning methods. They just weren't necessarily aware of where to get family planning methods. 
Um, so we were able to get more information to users and more referrals to users than is typical in you know, the healthcare industry. So that um, helped to get even more people interested and towards uh, some type of facility to access the um, healthcare methods of their interest or family planning methods of their interest. Um, and some of the things that we can get from our insights, you know, are we're able to see things like what types of information or what knowledge people are coming in with and what they're getting afterwards they leave our platform and afterwards they have conversations with us. People are constantly coming back. So that way, you know, it's the learning process is continuously ongoing. So things from like the first um, interactions with us, we can see things like people aren't sure if you can use more than one type of birth control method after we're talking about this they learn about you know all the different types of methods that you can use throughout your lifetime and throughout your health journey um, that meet your needs along the way um, a lot of people you know 46 percent of people didn't know <clears throat> that iucds and injectables are safe and they thought that it would cause infertility because it's a common myth that is discussed or it's a common issue and concern um, so, you know, after we're talking with us, they're able to like learn about these different things and see what is more useful to them or what might, you know, it, it um, creates confidence in something that they previously believed might not be right for them, but they were interested in. Um, and then in terms of medication abortion, which is something that is also very highly sought um, in a lot of these places, they were able to learn about different things about, you know, when are you able to get an abortion? Um, whether or not it's the same as any other FP option and what other options you could have afterwards if you know if you wanted to prevent pregnancy further on in your journey and it you weren't quite ready for um, that type of family planning to happen. Um, so in this uh, pilot study, we also talked directly with different people that use the app um, or used our chatbot rather, um, and they you know gave us some great feedback, letting us know that they really found that having the ability to chat with us and have a chatbot available really helped them get the information and understand information better. Um, and a lot of people think that, you know, a phone is only for entertainment, chatting with friends or things, but having the ability to show something like this to users, they were able to see that it's, you can use it as a learning tool. And then having something like this chatbot provides information to you at, you know, at your fingertips in a very easy way and makes it so that you are more aware of what is available to you and it can teach you um, different things. Um, and then also being able to provide you with complete information um, and, you know, having the ability of someone coming, like I previously mentioned, you know, someone comes in to the app, initially they're not sure, and then afterwards getting all this information, they're like, oh, you know, maybe I will actually try that method I was interested in. And now that I have all the information, I feel confident in making a decision to go to this recommended facility to get this product. Um, so, you know, using our um, chatbot, we're able to get more information to more hands because the mobile device is becoming something that is so, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the word infectious, but I can't think of another word at this moment. Um, but everyone seems to have something that they're able to get and they found that, you know, you can do a lot of different things with a mobile device and you and it's something where you can get vital sources of information. Um, because something is so easily carryable with you and you can bring it with you to different places and you can ask questions and you can get information at your fingertips and whenever you need it, it feels really empowering. So that way you're able to show up someplace, you know, and be able to advocate for yourself. That's not necessarily something that, you know, without this information that you could do, if you showed up somewhere before there was, you know, the pharmacist, the physician is going to make the suggestion for you based on whatever they think. But by having this information, you're able to show up and say like, this is what I would like. And by having something that's in a chat bot like this, you're easily able to um, have it be confidential. And you know that you're getting trustworthy information from a reputable source because of the way that we're presenting the information and our backing. And as it's also balanced information because we are making sure to meet users where they're at. And we want to be able to provide information to them along the point of what the journey that they're in and also not just skew them to one direction or something that might not fit for them. We make sure to give them a variety of information. And that's something that we have seen has been very useful for uh, users and they have are able to make decisions for themselves. So, yeah. 
I think Great. that's thank you I'm under Diana. yeah yeah, I set, you my were own under, so. I, set, I set my own timer afterwards. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. After I was okay. so stern about <laughs> cutting you off, you set your own timer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I'll ask you to unshare your screen. I think we'll go into the, the gallery mode so we can see everyone here. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A that have been answered. Um, so you guys can go ahead and check those um, if you're on the call listening in. Um, encourage you to put questions in there as we go along. Um, this portion is going to be moderated questions, and we'll start with um, one question that I'm really curious about. Um, what has been the most challenging part of developing your digital solution? You, know, you did talk about challenges in your presentation, and I think for Megan and Nick especially, you know, you've been developing um, uh, services around family planning and cervical cancer for many, many years, maybe even before the rise of digital solutions. Um, so what are some of the, yeah, what are, what's the most challenging thing that you've experienced? Um, I don't know, Nick, do you want to start or I can start? I can pop in. Um, well, I think one of the things that's really challenged us most, uh, which might be unique to academics, or so they, they tell us um, through the Office of Information Security at Duke, is the, um, the administrative oversight and regulatory oversight for these apps that are produced at the university um, and the interplay between the um, protected health information in the US and utilization of these in Kenya. So now Duke is requiring penetration testing um, for any app that's developed through Duke. Um, what is which, penetration testing? Uh, it's, you know, that, well, it costs about $50,000. Uh, and so anyone that develops any app that is owned by Duke has to undergo this testing to make sure, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it involves, but there are people that, there are organizations or, or consultants that do it. And it um, just makes sure that there's no uh, potential leaking of information or ability to access um, any protected health information that would leave um, Duke liable to vulnerabilities. And so, um, you know, I, we went through a little bit of this with MSADA and now I'm working on a second digital app for an AI colposcope. And um, it's not just that that's the requirement, the lands, the regulatory landscape has, is changing so rapidly and it's really hard to navigate from an academic perspective because they don't really, um, I think, in such a big institution, they don't really um, aren't able to move as nimbly and they're very conservative with their um, uh, approval process. And so understanding what they want and even for them to define what they want has been really challenging. And then I think the flip side is having consistent developer support in um, in Kenya and um, figuring out um, how to create open source, um, this open source platform, because now the, the ministry partners want to use this platform um, to be able to enable some of their screening. And so sort of figuring out um, how to actually, where, where to house it and um, how to uh, share the platform. I mean, it should be open source if they want it, um, has been a little complex. And then um, overlying all of that are the, the um, sort of increased needs in COVID that have taken away some personnel support um, from the ministry who were really pushing this. Yeah, fascinating. And I see some people on the chat who also are based in academia, so maybe they are can commiserate with you on some of those challenges. Um, Nick, do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, Jay is the Jay and his team are the kind of brains of our technology, so I'll let him answer separately. I mean, the two things that come to mind for me, I mean, first as a sort of an organization that wasn't, you know, fundamentally at first a digital health first organization. In other words, we came as a health system player, you know, we understood working with the government, we understood delivering healthcare services and sort of working in Kenya and human centered design and things like that. You know, we had to build the technology infrastructure and, um, and, you know, that was a sort of an interesting mix over time of, of sort of growing our internal team and also sort of leveraging and relying on some really phenomenal external resources, guys like organizations like Datakind and um, pro, no, pro bono support from, you know, 
sort of AI experts at, in Silicon Valley and things like that. Um, so that was, you know, that's, that was one hurdle, but I feel like that's, I don't know if that's necessarily a challenge. The other piece that I think is, you know, I, just from peers in the space that I think is sort of broadly a challenge across the digital health landscape is like, who's going to pay for it? And that's the like, and it's still something that is kind of the next big nut that we have to crack in terms of um, in terms of making these kinds of programs sustainable at a national level. Because you know we focused, as you can see, we focused on really getting the cost, the unit cost down of these interventions so that they're really cheap and really efficient to be able to distribute um, at scale. But you know our our other well, parallel, which is the sort of nurse mentorship program, like there is a precedent for governments paying for some of those kinds of training activities. In other words, our, our county government partnerships pay for half of the operating costs of those um, nurse mentorship programs because they're essentially like, hey, this is really cost effective. It's better than the other options that are out there. Let's just reallocate our budget lines. But with digital health, like most governments are new to this and, you know, figuring out ways of like non-grant ways, I should say, of 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 funding the sort of deployment of these kinds of programs at scale is challenging and we've seen you know it's like this is where you see the sort of pilots fail over time because <laughs> they can't get sort of traction in the funding landscape and so we're exploring right now a lot of different avenues for you know it's like is it working with the telecoms is it working with sort of insurance agencies and um sort of pay for performance type um things around value-based care but i think that's like one of the most challenging kind of bits for the digital health community certainly for us jay i don't know if you have anything to add on that yeah, I'll just echo pretty much what you said around costs. Uh, one of my uh, biggest challenges, I guess, has been how do we scale but keep the costs in line so that uh, even at the point where maybe a government, uh, the government might be adopting some of these, you know, we can't tell them here, here's, here's the program, it works great, but it costs a million dollars a year to run. So just uh, keeping that in and then um, also, the, the the Data Protection Act here was passed in Kenya last year, or 2019, end of 2019, and how to make sure that all of our programs are in line with that, all of our users' data is protected, um, and that, you know, we have all the appropriate consent uh, around sharing and storing data. Thanks. Yeah, Diana, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, I... Inside side, so I, like, in terms of who I... You're freezing a little bit. I think we're gonna have to skip Diana because she is frozen. Is she frozen for you guys too? Yeah, okay. Um, so let's just move on to the next question then. And this one is also something that I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, you do these user tests and you see like, what are, what are people asking and what, how do they use your system? Um, what's one of those surprising things that you learned about user behavior when developing your digital solution that you thought, you know, wow, why didn't I think of that or something along those lines? Go ahead, Nick. I saw you Jay, Jay, do you want to um, mention anything you're sort of dealing more directly with? The what do people ask chatbots? <laughs> Uh, well, um, you know, we get questions about everything and anything related to pregnancy, uh, you know, a, a diet, nutrition, things like uh, how, how do I sign up for the national insurance program? Um, what we try to do is because the consequence of the chatbot being wrong is potentially quite high, uh, we didn't want to deploy a traditional chatbot um, and instead just have a very focused response to um, you know high confidence uh, that the bot has detected what or, or knows what the mom's asking about um, and re re reply only with that information as opposed to a more general chatbot that might be uh, available but also to have it backed up by by um, by the help desk so that you know in case, even in that situation where something goes wrong, we have someone looking into it and making following up with the mom and, and correcting anything that, that may have been sent out erroneously. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there was, I, I'm sure some, some of you guys on the call uh, saw a recent article that sort of did a benchmarking of um, 
accuracy of some of these big digital health platforms that were um, using sort of artificial intelligence and bots to diagnose conditions. And it was like appallingly bad <laughs> across the, across the, you know, it was like 50% accuracy and like an up. And, but, um, you know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, so, some of it gets overhyped and is sort of overpromised the results. And we just, you know, because our, our primary concern is with the, the moms that we're interacting with, like, we don't want to risk getting it wrong in those cases. And so we've kind of interposed a person in just to as a sort of a quality check. And over time, as Jay pointed out, like we're gonna be handing off more and more to the bot where we're like, hey, 97% chance, low, low risk stuff like nutrition questions, it's totally fine to have the bot answering those questions directly. Um, but you know that there's a lot of back and forth with users, um, obviously in that instance too, to see what kind of questions are most important and also like which ones are most sort of urgent. Yeah. Um, so, Dan, I know you just joined us. I, I think you cut out for a second, but I think this question is actually really um, welcome back. <laughs> this question yeah, is actually you. really, um, really kind of a good one for you because it's it's around what surprising thing you learned about user behavior when developing your digital solutions. So you're the you know director of insights. What are some of the surprising insights that you found? Um, and just to fill you in, uh, Nick was saying that. Um, they do have, they've embedded a person in the center, so it's not all AI driven. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that at Ask Nivi and whether you're fully reliant on the chatbot and how you involve individuals. Yeah, yeah. So we are fully reliant on the chatbot. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of what are some interesting things or strange behaviors or things that we've seen, um, you know, it, it is, it goes on both sides of the user and also the like the um, partners that we have using both the insights like the dashboard like I am in charge of the insights so I make the dashboard and then also in terms of people interacting with the chatbot. Um, so things that we like typically see it doesn't seem to be that it, it's mostly just things around um, interesting like for me at least like interesting myths that I haven't heard of before um and things like how do you address those types of things that come up that aren't um like as new i guess misinformation or myths come up how do you address those like actively um that's like the different like the more interesting thing because we also you know not only have we been working with section reproductive health but we've also been working with some covid information and also accessing family planning services during covid which have been quite interesting and in coming up with different things and how to address the just massive amounts of information that people are getting from other sources and how to combat those types of thing and get them towards the right thing. Um, you know, we haven't had much of an issue of getting people towards the right things. It's just some of the things I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, um, things like strange folk remedies or home remedies that seem to be, um, I'm not sure where they've come from or whether or not things don't work together. You know, the typical things that we've all seen with COVID, but it's more things like, you know, use of, I, I, you know, use of soil and things like that in some strange places. And I'm like, okay, like I, that's like something that I have to <laughs> get past. Be like, okay, yes, um, I don't, I don't suggest doing that, but you know, move towards uh, normal like water and going to, a, you know, a pharmacy or a clinic instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Megan and yeah. I are actually working on a project with students at Duke to um, scrape Twitter data and then try to understand what misperceptions people have about yeah. oral contraceptives leading to fertility. So trying to, it's been uh, quite fun actually the last couple months working with a group of students who are trying to figure out what are the search terms we would even use to yeah. scrape tweets and like how do we get the right ones into our net and then what is the topic modeling approach, right? Like what are the pockets of misinformation? So I think it's, yeah, it's from my uh, perspective. It's, yeah, it's very interesting and some things you, I don't think anyone could ever <laughs> think about. How do you search for advance. that? Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> and in response to this, um, I saw this chat here, or this um, message in the chat. Um, so we are, we are actually in multiple languages. We have English, uh, Hindi and Swahili currently. Um, so we are able to, you know, get to more, people. Um, we also have some things that are pamphlet based and we also have a website available um, to get people towards different things and towards the chatbot and getting to the different types of care. Um, and with our study that we had, the recent pilot study in rural communities, we found that it actually doesn't seem to be as much of an issue as we you know, assumed that it would be. 
getting people to actually get into different things. I'm not sure if this is towards me or not, because then it goes on to talk about pre and postnatal journeys. Um, we are working on that as well, antenatal care and prenatal care. But I know that that's a, you know, a much more, a bigger issue in the current thing, maybe Jack around the Nick or Jay. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. pivot to the questions that are coming mm -hmm. in um, and to moderate some of those. Unless you had something to add, Megan, do you have any surprising anecdotes about going from, <laughs> you know, this clinical based research that's very much paper based and moving towards the digital solution. No, I think um, I talked about sort of what we assume that the CHVs would want in terms of the language and the images. One thing we found when we first started using texts is that although women um, wanted texts and we reviewed them with them at the time they got screened between the screening and when they got their test results back was two weeks. And often they didn't remember what they were tested for within the two weeks later. So we're, you know, 100% focused on our research and we are offering this service that we're trying to make fast and efficient for women. And so if they just stop by one day, they just may not, you know, it's definitely not in their top of mind two weeks later when they get their results. So we've started doing some reorientation with text between things for getting screening, you're going to get your results shortly, this is what to expect with a positive or a negative and sort of um, that's helped them be more receptive um, and not only expect, but understand their results. Yeah, that's interesting that they don't even remember what they were screened for. So there is uh, more engagement to, to do. Great, um, so I'm gonna go to the chat and read out some of these questions. Um, this is a question for Megan. You mentioned the Duke regulations for developing applications and the need for penetration testing. What have been experiences working with ministries of health and their regulations on security? Um, so we have done this through um, the Kenya, Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, and so having this done under an uh, IRB has sort of um, eliminated, has sort of taken it through a different route. And then when what we're working on now is integrating it with the existing platform and nonprofit called the International Cancer Institute has signed a memorandum of understanding with nine counties to manage their cervical cancer screening. And so we're working with their developers who are sort of um, managing the regulatory aspect. So they had worked out quite a bit of it already, but having that nonprofit um, or NGO intermediary has helped us, um, uh, one, because they have an existing relationship, but two, because they're dealing directly with with the ministry. So we haven't really had to navigate a lot of um, restrictions from the ministry. Great, um, another question. Um, and I think Diana mentioned this one a little bit, but um, in an area where very low reading and inability to have access to medical care for pre and postnatal, um, do you feel that a chatbot is essential as the only way to access and deliver care at scale? Um, and then I think this is for Jacaranda. Did you initially do the pre and postnatal journey and work out the minimum needed to get maximum impact on the ground and then introduce the AI? Or did you, how did you approach the problem? So here are two questions. Um, do you think a chatbot is essential when people can't access care? And how do you deal with literacy and, and all of that? Second question is, did you start from the patient journey and think about where to add AI? Or did you start from AI and then match up with I mean, I can answer the second question um, quickly, which is just that we started from the patient journey first. In fact, our platform evolved off of originally like um, CHW's uh, a research project that we did with some partners at Harvard where we were actually doing um, postpartum follow-ups with checklists via CHWs, both in person and then comparing it via phone and, you know, saw that the phone was just as effective and a lot cheaper. And then that sort of um, we sort of extrapolated that into text and saw that we had a lot of traction there too, but it has been an, um, an evolution, but it started with the patient journey initially in the postpartum period and then sort of working more broadly and adding more and more pieces to it. And then the AI is a relatively recent development. Um, I'll let someone else answer the other question because I think it's an important one. Yeah, around literacy and chatbots. And even for you, Megan, is MSADA, is that for community health workers or do women see the MSADA app as well? 
So that's what we'd like to do next. And we actually have a grant that's getting reviewed, I think today, um, to have it, um, to help us develop the patient interface. But we started, the platform we have now is just um, for the CHVs, but we do, it does send out text messages to women because we had um, in the area that we were working in, uh, there's a much smaller proportion of women that have smartphones compared to the basic phone. So they wouldn't necessarily be able to download an app. Um, but uh, we're hoping to further develop that. And we were actually just talking, um, we we're just brainstorming about whether a chatbot would be appropriate or would help between screening and treatment, um, making those decisions and helping to navigate where to go, what to expect, you know, um, because we, we are still looking at m multiple ways to impact that high attrition rate between screening and, and treatment. Um, some of the, you know, in terms of the uh, maybe low literacy, um, some of the things that we've been working with are in, um, in some of our, uh, I guess, states and um, areas that we're working in, we just launched in Nigeria and we've been working with having some offline promotions so that way people are actually working with people and getting them onboarded and then once they kind of see how, the, how to engage, then they're able to do things on their own. And um, we've also launched some things of having videos and tutorial types of things or like video, they're not just like advertisements, they're also showing how to use things and how you would engage with it and having that as part of the promotional type of material that goes along with it. And that helps a lot just, you know, seeing how to begin the engagement. They're like, oh, okay, now I understand. Like, this is how you start talking with something um, that isn't just necessarily um, your typical text situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like sometimes people get, I mean, that's a great, great point. And that sort of flexibility and being contextual about the environment that you work in is part of this sort of design process and really important. I mean, you know, we've had people tell us like, oh, no, you should be on WhatsApp because WhatsApp penetration is really big in, in Kenya. But then when we actually sort of queried the, the mothers that we were working with, we realized that actually, like, even though most of them had WhatsApp on feature, feature phones, you know, maybe 60% of the population, the data, the data costs made it, made it much more sort of mm. Their usage of it so we're like okay well text will actually get to folks but then as you point out i mean text doesn't get to everyone and particularly in some countries where literacy levels are low like you might need to go into ivr and other uh, other areas like that um you know really i think it needs to be adapted to the kind of the population that you're serving unfortunately i think some, it's getting it's getting easier to be able to apply a kind of a slightly more omni-channel approach um <clears throat> Great. Um, so that I think is all the, the Q and A's that have come in. And if you've been submitting a Q and A, you can find your answer um, in the question and answer portion of the Zoom app. Um, I think I can open it up for questions that people want to ask, um, and we can unmute you. So if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute you, and you can ask a question. Does everyone? Yeah, I'm like, it's, I say here, if you're not here, raise your hand. Um, if you know how to use Zoom, I'll just um, share my screen here. Um, that's my email. Stop sharing that for a second. Share. I want to share my Zoom thing. Let's see, does anyone, do you know how to raise your hand? All you have to do on the bottom of your Zoom window, there's that um, uh, participant. You want to click on participants, and then I think you can. Um, actually, I'm not sure you can raise your hand. Just say, Olivia, do you know if you, people can raise their hands? Uh, I don't think so. Um, oh, I think, okay. but you can you can uh, just put in the chat if you have a question, and I guess we can. Yeah, put in the chat if you have a question. We can unmute you. You can ask it. Um, also have a question here while we're waiting. Um, oh, there's a raise hand button. Tim Sladen says there's a raise hand button at the bottom. Great. Some other people say they can raise their hand. Great. Uh, 
Um, I'll read off this question that came in via the Q&A that hasn't been answered yet. Um, so Rachel from MSI says, we're dealing with many of the same issues around running contact centers at scale without just an increasing contact center agents. Um, I think that that is, is a good question for all of you. Like, how have you dealt with that? Delivering services at scale without hiring more people and what are some of the challenges of doing that? Uh, I can start. Uh, so uh, the AI that helps us triage and, and prioritize the questions was the first step. And then using that to actually answer questions directly um, was step two. Step three might be instead of sending and, and going back to one of the previous questions, just instead of sending a text response might just be to call the mom and play a pre-recorded uh, response and see, you know, is that more effective, first of all? Uh, and then within that response, um, have the option to talk to an agent, um, you know, press one to, to talk to someone. Um, but from, I'm not, I'm not a call center expert, but from our perspective, that's how we've kind of, um, you know, handled the increasing um, question volume uh, with some of these automations. Yeah, yeah. it seems like you've yeah, they've been able to do A-B testing. So that's really a part of your model is that you can test out different approaches and quickly learn about what's working, what's not working. Yeah, and I, I think, Jay, you can probably speak to this, but like there have been some economies of scale that's happened as a result of that. So both the introduction of the AI and then also sort of greater efficiencies. So like, you know, a year ago we were getting 500 questions a day. Now we're getting 1500 questions a day. We haven't had to triple the number of agents in the call center. We still have, we only have like nine or 10 or something like that. So it's actually a sort of a manageable number, even at a sort of a national scale to be answering all the questions that will be coming in from kind of moms who are enrolled in the platform across the country. Um, if you if you kind of manage it right. We have a question from Tim. He says, does anyone have experience working on sensitive sexual health issues? For example, working with people living with HIV, LGBTQ plus communities, or sex workers, are these communities receptive to AI systems? Um, so I would um, reach out to Sarah Legrand at the DJHI um, in Chipper. She is working with um, sexual and gender minorities in South Africa to develop um, a uh, I think she has evolved from a um, chat room to a moderated chat room to chat bots um, looking at HIV prevention and sexual health issues. And she's very accessible and would be happy to talk to you about her work. She does great stuff. I'll put her um, email in the Q&A. Um, I see another one coming in. It says, oh, that's Nick's response. I think anyone on the call is probably always happy to chat and answer your questions. I see, I don't see a lot of other questions coming in and we have about nine minutes left. So I'd be happy to let everyone go early. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of the panelists who um, joined us today to talk about their great work in sexual and reproductive health, family planning, um, cervical cancer prevention. It's really fascinating to hear about all your lived experience <laughs> of creating digital health solutions and you know, can, can a digitally enabled solution work? It's been really great talking to you all. Um, Olivia and Christina, do you wanna say any final closing words? Yep, I can go ahead. Um, so if you're not already signed up for our mailing list, I've put a link in the chat so um, you can hear more about these great seminars. And I want to thank all of our panelists today for being on this call and uh, sharing what you're doing. So thanks so much, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, thanks. Bye, everyone.